I think my policy on book reviews has made me a very unpopular author. <laughs> I have found that there are so many authors who either agree with kind of my policy, but just won't publicly say that they do, or they absolutely disagree. And so my policy when it comes to book reviews is that if you read a book, you should review it. <laughs> now, again, obviously, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not like the book review police. I'm not going around hounding people to write book reviews. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I just mean that if you're someone like me who has put myself out there on like social media blogging, you know, like if you're making all of these efforts to put yourself out there in the public, and then, yeah, you should write book reviews. And so um, there are some authors who refuse to write book reviews. And there are some who have book review practices that might be questionable. Um, there are some who are very intimidated by the backlash from writing book reviews. And I get that. So um, I at RavenCon did a presentation on how to write book reviews or not. And it's basically this presentation that I um, do to kind of teach people how to write book reviews if they don't know how to, but I also kind of explain like why. With that said, I think um, the book reviews that I'm going to be posting today are kind of some of that reason why maybe why other writers, not just like if you're just a reader, then you don't, I don't think you have as many excuses tonight, right? <laughs> but as a writer, it can be difficult to write book reviews because of the way the industry is set up. So um Anyway, my point is, is that I'm going to be sharing a five-star review today and a two-star review. And for some writers, um, they don't have that option to write a two-star review because people will like come after them. And I get that. Um, I'm not anyone special. So if someone comes after me, I don't really know what they're going to get out of it. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe if I was Stephen King, which actually Stephen King doesn't seem to have a problem promoting other authors. Um, I guess if they share the same publisher, like he'll say like, oh, you should read this book by, you know, whoever. Um, and I, I guess that's the same or not the same, depending on how you look at it. Anyway, I'm done with that. So let's just get into it. So here are the book reviews for the month of April. I'm going to start with The Invisible Library. I gave this an overall star rating of five. This was my pick for the IWSG um, April Challenge of Libraries. So the challenge was library and this was the book I picked. So other people read other library books. They didn't have to read this one. So let's just get into it. It says, I really enjoyed this book and have already picked up the second in the series. I haven't started it yet, but I'm going to. I want to finish a book that I'm reading now before I get to that. But anyway, <laughs> um, I read this book for the IWSG Book Club April, um, should say 2023. I need to fix my review. <laughs> Library challenge. Of the two books I plan to read, this was by far the best a magical library that exists beyond space and time with librarians who hunt down rare books is already an enticing premise, but when you add in a great mystery and diverse characters, I'm all in. So yeah, I do like the fact that this story has um, diverse characters, not in the sense that um, I think some people have a narrowed view of diversity in books, um, and again, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that's what you're looking for in a book, then hone it. Don't let anyone tell you different. But I feel like sometimes when you hear the word diverse characters, people automatically assumed, oh, this book has brown people in it. <laughs> like there, pe brown people have been excluded from like the literary world for so long that if you say the term diverse characters, that means it has brown people in it. <laughs> and I'm not saying that this book doesn't have brown people in it, but what I do mean is that there's multiple cultures represented in the story. And that's the thing that you don't always get. You know, you might have a story taking place in some small town where all of the characters are brown um, and that's considered um, diverse characters, which because of the lack of representation, it is. I think a lot of times what happens is you have a, a book where none of the characters in the book are brown. And so you're like, hmm, how diverse are those characters? Well, depending upon where those characters come from, it could still be diverse. It just may not be what you're looking for. 
So um, very diverse characters, um, different backgrounds, ethnicities, languages, things like that. So I like that. Um, I love the concept of the language and how it's used in this book. I also like that the magical system is so complex, considering different levels of science, different levels of magic, and a rogue element called chaos, but I don't want to give away spoilers. So the magical system in this book is extremely complicated, but it's not ex like it's not complicated to understand. Like the way the author writes it, you get it right away when you and you get that it's not just good magic or bad magic or science or versus magic. Like it's all of these things and more. So I really thought that was um creative the way the author did that. I enjoyed the portrayal of two very different main female characters. One is the MC, which means main characters, and the other is a supporter. Um, growing in the knowledge and understanding of both these women shows how female characters can be different without being polar exaggerated opposites. I was delighted that they weren't straightforward damsel versus vixen characters. So um, yes, yeah, so the one was the actual main character. The other was a supporting character, but she's very much like part of the whole story. And so I liked the fact that these two women were depicted in a very kind of real way. I know this is fiction, but like a lot of times you have female characters that are extreme opposites, like the good character or the bad character, um, the sexy character or the plain homely character, like, you know, like just this extreme like opposite. But I like the fact that these two characters were healthy doses of kind of all of those things, you know? And so um, I really appreciated that. The male characters were a good balance of bodyguard and detective tropes without being toxically masculine, though there is a sense of some of some traditional gender expectations at play it was it's a nice balance so yeah the the men the male characters in the story are really good um there is some of that typical like <laughs> male bravado where the men like will do certain things to kind of like show off their masculinity but it's not done in like a negative way i think um there is a sense of maybe some traditional roles um like gender roles at play but it it, it makes sense to the story being told um, if you go back in history and visit, like if you go back to visit a time in history, even though you might be a forward thinking person, the rest of the world isn't. So to survive in that place in history, you may have to revert to some more traditional gender roles. And I thought um, that was a good balance. I'll admit that I sometimes get tired of reading stories taking place, um, taking place in New York, LA, London, or Paris. I usually feel like these have been overdone and prefer stories to be character driven if they exist in one of these cities. With that said, I enjoyed this alternate version of London. It felt much like my other experiences of reading about cities I've never visited, which I've never visited London in real life. It felt new and exciting. So there are just certain like just like in movies and um, TV shows, it, it happens in books where there are certain cities that are just written about a lot. And again, nothing wrong with that, but sometimes it's just like, I'm in London again, I'm in New York again, I'm in LA again. And so it's like, even for someone like me who hasn't visited these places because I've read about them so much, because I've seen them so much in movies that I have like a certain impression about those places. And I'm not saying that I, um, I don't need to go visit them because of that. What I'm saying is i I'm just so familiar that when I read stories taking place in those places, there's a certain part of me that's like, I already know some of how this is going to go because of where the story is taking place. With that said, I liked the way this alternative um, version of London was presented. It was very traditional, like it felt like London, but there was also some other little cool things where I was like, okay, I like that. Overall, highly recommended to fans of high urban fantasy. Um, book lovers, mystery enthusiasts, and fans of intricate worlds with diverse characters. So um, I'm not even sure if high urban fantasy is a thing, but I threw it in there because I do feel like the magic system here lends itself more towards um, high fantasy, but there are some very urban fantasy elements to it. There's also an element of steampunk that I didn't mention in my review, and I'm wondering if I should go back and do that or just leave it as it is. Anyway, I very much enjoyed The Invisible Library and I will be reading more 
of the series. So that was my five star review for the month. Now it's time for the two star. So um, both of these books I read for that challenge. And um, so the next one is Lulu's Library, a complete collection, 30 plus stories for children. So this is a collection of short stories for kids, fairy tales, written by Louise May Alcott. She is the author of Little Women. And so I'm going to get into my review. DNF'd at 70%. So straight out the gate, I have a policy that if I ever DNF a book, it gets a two-star rating. That's just how it is. I give it a two-star rating because I'm not finishing it. And I like to give the benefit of the doubt that says if I had finished it, there might have been something at the end to make me like it more than I did up to that point. But because I'm not willing to go any further, two is where I stop. So <laughs> I tried really hard to get through these stories, but life is too short to read books you don't enjoy. Again, I'm on a sabbatical right now, <laughs> if you could call it that, from reading nonfiction just because I kind of got burned out on it. I am going to return to nonfiction at some point, but not right now. Like I'm in a mindset, I'm in a mind place where if I'm going to read something, I need to enjoy, I need to be getting something out of it. And this wasn't doing it. All right. I read this book for the IWSG book club, April 20. Oh my goodness. I did the same thing here. I said 2022. I'm going to have to update this. Anyway, library challenge. I was excited to read a collection of children's stories by the person who wrote Little Women, but this wasn't a good experience for me. Ultimately, I think this work simply doesn't stand up to all of the cultural and societal changes that have occurred from when this was written to now. It's just too out of date and too specific to the place, time, and demographic this was written for. It's a niche that may not fully exist anymore, though I can see others being able to better appreciate this work than I am. So plainly, if I'm just going to put it out there, this book was not written for a middle-aged Black woman in the 21st century, plain and simple. Uh, nothing against Louise May Alcott, but this book is just extremely out of date. Um, there is some merit to it. I don't want to make it seem like the stories are horrible. They're not horrible stories. And you'll see just what I say in, in the rest of the review in just a moment. But honestly, like, it's just, you reach a certain point in your life. Again, my, this whole thing about not wasting time reading things that aren't enjoyable to me. Um, I've been talking about like diversity and representation and stuff like that. To read something that clearly was not meant for you or like watching something that was clearly not meant for you. It's like, I'm not mad at this person for doing this. I'm mad because no one told me that maybe this wasn't for me, <laughs> you know, like, and again, um, I'm not, and mad is not the right word. What, I'm, what I basically mean is just, this is just not written for me. Um, it is very much the, I mean, again, I can see other people finding historical appeal to it. The, the, the stories are clever, they're cute. I mean, you know, but there's just nothing in these stories that if I had lived at that time, which, I mean, I guess there were Black people who were reading at that time. So yeah, so um, let, let me not get too exaggerated with my emotions. <laughs> but my point is, is I, I if a kid, uh, a little Black girl who could read at that time had picked up these stories, she wouldn't have been able to relate to them. These would have been, so fantastical she'd be like oh this is clearly for miss so-and-so's daughter she must have lost her book or something like that like it just um and and it's not just about being black either like I, I mean and again I'm not putting myself into other people's mind. I'm just making an assumption here I don't think a, um, a Hispanic person will overly be able to relate to this um, or an Asian person will overly be able to relate to it. I am not saying that these stories don't have any merit. They do. That's, I'm just saying that when you are reading books, watching TV, watching movies, and you don't see yourself in it at all, you can't relate to it at all, it's really hard to jump into it. I, I am a firm believer that people are more alike than they are different. So don't get me wrong. I can 
watch movies that have an all white cast and find something to relate to. I've done it my entire life. So that's not what I'm saying here. I'm just saying that this is very much out of date and very much written for a specific demographic place and time. And I'm just not that demographic. It's not my place, not my time. And that's okay. This is not for me. I'm going to finish reading my review. I may finish this collection one day, but not now. If for no other reason than I think it would be a fun challenge to rewrite many of these stories for a modern audience. I cannot recommend this to any of my personal friends, but could recommend it to students of cultural studies and fans of historical depictions. So yeah, I mean, if you are just a, you know, a huge, you know, cultural studies person or historical um, studies person, anthropology or something like that, I think you could definitely, you know, read this and find, this is, think you could say, hey, at the time that this was written, these are the kinds of stories that kids like to read. This is what they found entertaining. And it's good sometimes to do those comparison between what kids did now and what kids do today. Like it still blows my mind that kids don't play outside anymore. And, you know, like they, I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand that video games are awesome, but I remember also still wanting to play outside as a kid. So again, I'm not bashing this book um, for what it is. I'm just saying that this book was not written for me. And so that's why I stopped reading it. And um, that is what I read in the month of April. Yeah, I lost, lost it for a second there. What? And so I'm hoping that my May reading experience will be a little bit better. And so um, I would love to know what you guys read, if you have any thoughts about some of the things I read. And until next time, guys, stay safe and be blessed. Hey, if you like what you see, subscribe to the channel, give it a like, and also leave me a comment. I would love that. Okay, bye.